The Holy Gospel according to the sixth chapter of Mark. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching in Jesus' name, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason the, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask for me whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The Death of John the Baptist not the most pleasant part of Mark's gospel. Pretty gruesome, actually. It serves as a foreshadowing of what's to come. Some commentators I read said that this is when Jesus's ministry really gets serious. For the first time, we see the consequences of his message and way of repentance and truth. But what we also see here is a bigger picture lesson about power and leadership and two very different approaches to those that we encounter in Herod and in Jesus. First, Herod. He is called king in the New Testament and throughout our reading today, but he wasn't actually king. He was one of three sons who inherited a divvied up kingdom from their father, Herod the Great. They were a client kingdom of Rome, meaning that they paid tribute to the Roman emperor and they owed him their allegiance. When Herod the Great died with this crazy inheritance plan to split his kingdom into three pieces, the emperor approved it. And so the older brother, Archelaus, received the largest portion of land, including Sumeria and Judea, the younger half-brother, Philip, mentioned in our gospel today, ruled over the northern part of the kingdom. And this guy, Herod, or Herod Antipas, as he's known in historical documents, inherited Galilee and a thin stretch of land called Pyria, which pretty much means middle of nowhere. He'd only inherited these properties because his older brothers, the oldest ones, his father had had killed because they were plotting against him. Yikes. So Herod didn't have much, but what he had was his, and he wanted to hang onto it and the power that went with it no matter what. But you see, at this point, 
he's got himself into a bit of a bind. This whole thing that John the Baptist accuses him of, marrying his brother's wife, it's true. He had married his brother Philip's wife. But here's the real tricky part. Herod had already been married. According to other historical records, Herod had been married to a woman named Phasaelus, the daughter of his enemy to the east, just the next kingdom over, King Eratos of Nabatea. It was uh, this marriage had been a calculated political alliance, bringing about an uneasy peace between these two regions right next to each other that were constantly on the brink of war. But for some reason, Herod decides to ditch her for his brother's wife, Herodias, who I also found out is actually his niece from his other half-brother's side, the, the side that dad had, had killed off. Ooh, so yeah, this, uh, this family's got some issues, for sure. Anyway, when uh, Herod Antipas, this Herod from our story today, and Herodias decide to divorce their current spouses and get married, they not only make an enemy of Philip, Herodias' husband and Herod's brother, but also of King Eratos and the whole kingdom of Nabatea. And when Phasaelus, Herod's first wife, hears of his plan to leave her, she manages to escape back to her father's kingdom. And when she is safe, that opens the way for her father, King Eratias, to declare all-out war on Herod and his tiny kingdom. And then, of course, John the Baptist gets himself involved by publicly speaking against the marriage as immoral and dangerous. So Herod, of course, locks him up. It's a pretty complicated, ugly, downright nasty situation all around. So, what does Herod do? Well, he throws a party. The gospel tells us that he gave himself a birthday party and invited the courtiers and officers and the leaders of Galilee. Now, why does Herod do this when he's on the brink of going to war with his neighbors and has caused all this drama in his kingdom and between his brother's kingdom and himself? Well, he's got a schmooze. He knows that war with Nabatea is coming. He needs to wine and dine the elite of Galilee so that they are ready to defend him with troops and weapons and food and support. This isn't a birthday party to celebrate himself. He wants something from these people. He needs something from these people. He has to show them with a lavish meal and body boasting that he is the horse they want to back in this race. He wants to show them what kind of leader he is. Vote for Herod, he's our man. And so in the story, when that fateful moment comes, after he's braggingly promised Herodias' daughter Salome that she can have whatever she wants, well then, he has to prove it. She asks for John's head on a platter. And Herod has to show his guests what kind of leader he is. He has to back up his boasts and swagger with actual action. And so, he does. He orders John to be killed. He can't back down from his promise, not now, with all these important people in the room. He shows them, and us, exactly what kind of man he is. Selfish. Power hungry. Dangerous. Ready to do anything and everything necessary to keep that power and get what he wants, which is the title and the rule and the approval of the emperor for the rest of his life. Now, our second example of leadership, Jesus. Now, I know Jesus isn't even in this story today that we read, but our gospel story today is sandwiched between two important, very well-known stories about Jesus. Immediately before today's gospel reading, we have the story of Jesus sending out his disciples two by two. 
We're told that he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. And if a place does not receive you, shake the dust from your feet. And then right after our gospel reading today, after John's very unfortunate end, we have another familiar story. The feeding of the 5,000. Jesus gathers his disciples back together and takes them away for a little retreat. Of course, that's not what happens. The people find them and they flock to Jesus. But instead of getting frustrated with them, Jesus has compassion, the gospel says. And so he provides a meal for all of them, a simple communion of bread and fish for all to eat. What a contrast these stories are with the smooth schmoozing of the elites that we see in Herod. Jesus shows us a totally different way to lead. First, he shares leadership. He doesn't hoard it all for himself. He freely hands over his authority and his skills, teaching the disciples how to do the work he does. This is called keychain leadership in modern leadership studies, handing over the things you know. He also teaches them to depend on others and trust in the goodness of those they meet on the roads to meet their needs. Not in a self-promoting way like Herod, who needed their money and their supplies, but in the way of humility and friendship. And Jesus also teaches them good boundaries. If people don't receive you, he says, shake the dust from your feet and move on. Don't spend your time trying to convince them of something or trying to schmooze them. Just let the Holy Spirit do its work of bringing about faith. And then in the feeding of the 5,000, which is actually about 10,000, when you count women and children, thank you, Jesus shows us another way of leading. First, he shows us that rest and renewal are important, and you have to make time to do that. Second, he shows me that we should be able to assess when our presence as leaders is needed and make the call to give of your time despite the need for rest, trusting that it will come at a later time. He knew that he was needed in that moment. And last, he shows us that we need to take care, a good leader, take cares of their people with abundance and generosity. So two very different pictures of leadership we have here. Both real life examples from the ancient world and ones we can see at work in our world today. And both effective, to a point, Herod was eventually dethroned and banished to Spain after losing the war with Nabatea. And Jesus, well, we all know what happens to him and what happened to John. But here we are, 2,000 years later, still telling his story. The difference is that Jesus, he knows the cost of his leadership and his message, and he still does it anyway. He knows it is difficult. He knows it will create enemies, but he doesn't do it for himself. He doesn't do it for fame or fortune or power or ego. He does it for us, for me and for you, for the rich and the poor, for the powerful and the forgotten, for your best friend and for that neighbor you can't stand, for the schmoozers and the boozers, the politicians and the lawyers, the social workers and the aid providers, the saints and the sinners. Jesus's way may not have been easy. It may not have been successful in our usual definition of the word, but he showed us everything we need to know about him and about God, God the parent who fights for us, feeds us, equips us, and sends us out to share his love of truth and peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.